What's going on everybody? It's Chip Walton. I'm in the Chop and Brew Mobile. I'm here with Jonas Walton who has recently taken to really enjoying just hanging out in the car while it's not moving in our driveway and acting like he's driving it, acting like he's honking the horn. Sometimes we play with the windshield wipers. That's not what we're here to talk about. What I'm here to talk about is May 7th big brew day. Y'all know we put out the Kolsch recipe, the Saison recipe. We're getting really excited. Another awesome thing that's coming up as part of Big Brew Day is my homebrew club here in the Twin Cities, the Minnesota Homebrewers Association. We are working with The Lab, and The Lab is a pilot brewery and tasting room here in the Twin Cities that I've always wanted to do an episode on and will in the future just about The Lab. But before then, The Lab is hooking us up. They are brewing seven barrels of a wheat beer base. Think Hefeweizen uh, rather than American wheat, I've been led to believe. And we're getting five and or 10 gallons. I'm getting 10 gallons of this wheat beer work. Already boiled, already chilled, put it in a bucket. So my question to you is with 10 gallons of free wort, not free, I'm paying for it. But in this world where time is worth more than money, it's pretty much free since I didn't have to brew it. What should I do with this? Like the obvious suggestion would be a half of Weizen, but um, maybe not. Or maybe five of Hef and five of something else. Maybe 10 one-gallon something or others to test dry hopping or additives. I don't know. So real quick, watch this conversation that I had with Alex Gruber when he and I were talking all things Imperial Yeast and Big Brew Day last week. I also threw him the question of what I should do or what he would do with some unexpected wheat beer work. He's got some ideas. I have some, but more importantly, I want to hear your ideas in the comments below. What should I do? What kind of yeast would you do? If uh, What kind of fermentation temperature schedule would you do with certain yeast? What kind of really cool left ball, a uh, left ball, <laughs> left field curveball? I don't know. I, was, I meant to say something from left field and I tried to say curveball at the same time. That is cray cray. Um, what kind of curveballs would you throw at this work? So I want to hear from y'all. Let me know. I'm going to have 10 gallons coming to me, and then I'm going to document the event and my fermentations, whatever I decide them to be. So check out this quick conversation with me and Alex nerding out about wheat beers and ideas for things to do. And uh, Jonas and I are going to get back to honking that horn, boy. <laughs> beep, beep. <laughs> oh, bap, bap. <laughs> Chop for chop, brew for brew. So I'm here once again with Alex Gruber from Imperial Yeast. Uh, Alex just found out that I'm being gifted, or not gifted, I paid for it, but I'm being blessed with 10 gallons of wheat beer base wort from the lab in Minnesota. The lab is a pilot brewery and tap room. They're doing a wort share for Big Brew Day. I got 10 gallons coming at me. So my thought was five gallons would be a Hefeweizen. And granted, that's saying one of many things right there. But then the other five, I kind of wanted to bounce some ideas off of somebody who loves to think all things yeast uh, and figure out what to do with that. So first and foremost, if I'm trying to make a Hefeweizen, I assume I'm hanging out with Stefan. Yeah, I think that would be the place I would start for sure. That's, that's kind of a classic. Uh classic Hefeweizen yeast for that. And then the other thing though, like some people like a clovey Hef. My wife loves a bubble gummy Hef. There's the banana. So could you talk me through a little bit with that one single strain between kind of like pitch count and temperatures or yeah. other elements? Like how would we achieve those three things kind of in particular? Totally. So I think that the the place I would go is exactly what you mentioned first, which is pitch rate. I think that uh, as a home brewer, you, you don't often get a chance to, to really explore pitch rate in the same way that maybe professional brewers can. Um, so for this in particular, if you have like enough uh, heft wort where you're gonna be able to maybe do some side-by-side -side batches, I think what would be really fun to do is, is play around with pitch rate and um, I mean, we tell you how many cells are in our homebrew packs, so you can do the calculations yourself to figure out. But most of the time, pitching a full pack of our yeast into uh, five gallons of, of like 14-ish Play-Doh beer 
will get you a pitch rate. And I apologize if it, this is getting too technical here, but it'll get you a pitch rate of about three quarters of a million cells per milliliter per degree Plato. And that's like pretty much industry standard uh, pitch rate. Um, what you could do if you really wanted to play around with what this yeast does in different situations is actually drop that pitch rate to about half a million. So basically, if, if you were to use normally a full pack of our yeast, uh, maybe only use two thirds of it and, and do that a little bit lower pitch rate, um, make sure it's well homogenized before you pitch it in there. Um, because those lower pitch rates can often, they can boost those, those ester profiles. And particularly with the banana and the bubblegum characteristics, those can get really interesting. Uh, often that, that kind of banana-y uh, aroma at, at certain concentrations, that compound will come off as banana, but once you get high enough, it can start to come off as bubblegum. So it's this really interesting thing where you can kind of, you can really see again, like how the yeast can, can stretch its legs in terms of expressing itself. Um, there are definitely risks if you go with pitch rates that are too low. It can affect your, your fermentation health and you might get an incomplete fermentation, but at about half a million cells per milliliter per degree Plato, it'd be a really fun thing to try that alongside a normal pitch rate and, and really see the range that a half could come out at. What about temperature? So I know it's confusing here, and this is why when I first started homebrewing, I was like, oh, it's just like every hobby where it can be way too complicated. <laughs> Nothing simple, but let's say we, we're just going to pitch the pack, what does temperature do with the beer, like a Hefeweizen and then the strain, Stefan specifically? So this is gonna be another one where I'm, I'm, I'm probably gonna give a more complicated answer than- Yeah, man, get nerdy, that's what we're here for. <laughs> so unfortunately, I, it's not quite as linear of a relationship as, as it would maybe be easiest if it were, where the higher temperature you get, the more ester production you get. You might get that more ester production, but often what comes with the higher temperature fermentation is also a more vigorous fermentation where you might be blowing all, off a lot of these aromatics that are being produced. Um, but if, if they're not gonna stay in the beer, then you know, you're know you not gonna get them at the end. So it's, it's, I think it's just important to think that it, hotter temperature doesn't mean more ester, more phenol. Like it's, it's not a simple thing like that. You can often, kind of hit a peak maybe as your temperature goes up and then maybe drop off a little bit again. I would love to see some type of curve out there that that neatly quantified how that works out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think for the most part, if you, let's say you normally, you're used to doing like a, a half fermentation, uh, I don't know. We were talking about doing Stefan. So I guess maybe if you're used to doing about 68 degrees or something, maybe try doing it like, 72, 73, really boost that and, and kind of see what it does. Um, and at the same time, you know, play around with temperature and pitch rate. There's, there's a lot of wiggle room and, and flexibility you can have within uh, just a couple of variables. But it sounds like pitch rate at a lower end temp actually sounds like it's more impactful. That's what I would say. I would normally, and again, like if you're gonna try this, just try tweaking one variable at a time. Like, um, <laughs> Try the pitch rate first. If you get a pitch rate that you like, but it's still not maybe quite getting to where you want, maybe try that lower pitch rate and, and bump your fermentation temperature up like three degrees or something like that. So I got my half and now I got five gallons to play with. And even in the half, I'm like, I could split it and do one and this. So I could have yep. four. Well, let's just say I'm going for two beers. This other five gallons, I've kind of thought, oh, well, you know, you can't really just throw an American yeast at it and make an American wheat ale because I think the hopping, which is already done at the brewery, is mm -hmm. more in line with a half. So there could be dry hopping. There could be, uh, I mean, there's not a whole lot of options I see other than messing with the strain. So what kind of strains could you see throwing at a half base to make a very different beer? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, off the top of my head, I think a fun one could be to to go with like a, a B44 whiteout or something like that, like kind of more of a traditional wit strain. Um, especially if you were going to like really flex your muscles with it and maybe add a dry hop in with that. Um, just to like, I don't know, get weird. And it's like you said, you've, you've already made your hep, so, so have some fun. I think that the B44 whiteout, it, it can 
play really interestingly with hops, which is kind of fun because it's not a strain that normally gets paired with particularly hoppy beers or, or recipes. Um, so that could be a fun one uh, to maybe play with a small dry hop on there and, and see how that goes. Man, that's real. I wouldn't have, I mean, in my head, yeah, wit beer, but the wit beer, what makes a wit beer is all the stuff that was thrown in in the boil, right? So that's kind of why my brain didn't go there. Um, yeah. One thing I was thinking is I love making graph, which is kind of a wort cider combination. And I was like, ooh, a Weizen graph. <laughs> so oh. I don't know, like uh, how, you know, the tartness of apple cider, you know, the, kind of the tartness of wheat, but I don't, you know, I've heard a lot of really interesting ideas already coming out of this, this little thread we have of people that are picking up wort. So it's going to be one of these things where if we can plan to go back two or three months later and have like a bottle share. I don't think it's going to be just a room full of Hefeweizen. <laughs> I think that'd be really cool. I think if you were going to do that, I would stick within the German ale strains too. Um, just because they tend to be a little bit more acid tolerant. And so if you were wanting to like, mm. and, and like by that, they also produce a little bit more acid. So maybe get like a little crisper, like, yeah, that'd be really fun. That sounds, I want to try that. Like a like Dieter or Kaiser, right? Same thing we're throwing. Yeah, right? yeah. All those those G strains, uh, Kaiser, Dieter, even Stepan. Um, but I think probably Go two Kaiser, Go three uh, Dieter would be the the ones I would I would maybe lean towards if you're going to do that. It's called a graph. Yeah, it's a graph. It's like a fictional beverage that the backstory is it's from like Stephen King novels, okay. um, but over the years it's kind of become a um, you know, a fictional fermentation category, especially in like cider competitions, it'll be kind of like specialty because um, the way I do it usually is three gallons of a wort and then two gallons of an orchard fresh cider. You blend them together and pitch a yeast and co-ferment them. So they're really good. You always get like this malty sweet element, but the the tartness from the cider and the thing that I still cannot peg quite perfectly is like that cider just drags that final gravity down. Even if you mash, I've mashed the wort part of the graph at like 158, 160, and it still just drags it all the way almost down to one. So they're really good. The most recent one I did is a smoked graph and it tastes like, like apple cider glazed smoked ham and it's awesome. Whoa. <laughs> oh, awesome. That sounds rad. But I like the idea of, of the of the German ale, because that's what I was going to ask is what yeast you would throw at that. Yeah, I think if you were, yeah, I, I, that's where I would go. There may be some other strains, but yeah, I think that'd be a good starting point. All right. Well, I will let you know what we decide, and maybe I can send some bottles of all of these things, the hef, yeah. the whatever, not hef, saison, <laughs> All right, thanks for uh, thanks for your input. Alex is super cool. And there's no such thing as too nerdy, for sure. That's great. Because you go other places and they definitely don't get nerdy enough. <laughs> well, yeah, if you if you ever have any nerdy questions, you know, I'm always here. <laughs>